Hey, did, uh, did you hear about the guy that uh, came forward for, uh, uh, for healing? And, uh, you know, uh, the pastor met him down below and he said, well, uh, you know, son, how, how can I pray for you? And he said, well, pastor, I want you to pray for my hearing. And he says, okay. So the pastor leans over and he, he grabs both of his ears and he just <laughs> prays fervently for his hearing. And then, and then at the end he says, okay, now, uh, how is it now? And he says, well, I don't know yet. Pastor, my, I don't go to court till Wednesday. <laughs> uh. Hey, listen, we're going to talk about the God of miracles today as we look at the uh, feeding of the 5,000. And uh, you know, our God is the God of miracles. I've got something on my desk that reminds me of that uh, from Hobby Lobby. <laughs> it's cheap, 50% off. It says that miracle believer, miracle believer, that's what I've got on my day. And I have to remind myself that God's in the miracle business, you know. He's in the miracle business, and he wants to do miracles in our lives. Just a couple of things. I'm going to share some stories at the end, but a couple before we get into our passage. But, but before that, I, there's a, a couple of things that just God reminded me of what a God of miracles he really is. Uh, several years ago, uh, I was involved in starting a church up in Reno, and I'm going to share more about that at the end. Uh, but uh, that church has grown into be a mega church nowadays. And uh, the pastor there that I started the church with, uh, you know, he's, he's gone through all kinds of things. He's just a couple years younger than I am. But God continues to use him in a miracle way. Uh, about 15 years ago, he uh, was changing one of those fluorescent light bulbs, the old-fashioned kind that are real thick. And it blew up in his face. He sucked in all that phosphorus into his lungs, and he's, he's was, been sick ever since, on and off. But you know, he says, God, you called me to preach, and every time he gets up to preach, now he's preaching to a lot of people every, every week, every time he gets up to preach, he says, God just takes it away, I'm perfectly healthy, my voice is strong, and he says, the next day I may be sick in bed, but he says, every time, and he's done that for year after year after year. And you know, on top of that, his kids used to play with my kids, one of his kids committed an overdose on drugs. You know, he's had all kinds of tragedies, and yet God is still working in his life. And this morning, he's going to preach to probably 3,000, and he's opening it up to the entire audience to ask any question they want right out of the audience about Christian living. Uh, Pastor Jim's going to do that next week, so you come and uh, bring, your, bring your toughest questions. And, and no, don't ask him a question about the book of Numbers, but... Uh, Anyway, he's going to do that today because he just believes, you know, that, uh, that God is still using him, even though now he's, he's uh, finally turning things over to a younger pastor as he gets, as he gets up there. But uh, you know what? We're going to look at the God of miracles here, and uh, we're going to, the first thing you're going to see here on your fill-in is that, uh, you know, our God wants you to uh, do miracles in your life, but he wants you to... Uh, increase your faith. He's going to do it by increasing your faith. And how's he going to do that? Let's look at this passage here and uh, we'll get into it. Uh, Mark uh, chapter um, 6, and I'm going to just go ahead and read some of these verses for you, uh, starting in verse 34. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And if you look around the world today, boy, is there ever, I mean, we ever need some shepherds in this world, right? There's a lot of lost sheep out there, I'll tell you. And he began to teach many things. And when it grew late, his disciples came and said, this is a desolate place and the hour is now late. Send them away. Here's the disciples, send them away, Jesus. Send these people away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy something themselves to eat. But he answered, you give them something to eat, and uh, we'll pick up the story in John to see there's a little bit more to it. As, as, shall we go and buy 200 denarii? That's about uh, eight months worth of, worth of wages. How would you like to be told? Hey, take eight months out of your next salary and go buy these people food. He said, to, it's going to take at least that much to feed these people. Uh, and he said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they had found out, they came and said, five and two fish. And then I'm going to go ahead and just uh, continue to read uh, the rest of the story here. Then he commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. 
And so they sat down in groups by hundreds and by fifties. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed them, blessed it and broke the loaves and gave it to the people, to the disciples and so forth. And when they divided the fish among them all and they ate it all up and were satisfied and they took up the 12 baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. And those who ate there were about 5,000 men, which means there was probably 15 to 20,000 uh, women and children there uh, along with the men. A huge crowd and God did an absolute miracle. And uh, God takes whatever, we're gonna learn this morning, is that God takes whatever you have and he blesses it and he multiplies it. And I believe that one of the reasons that God has blessed this church is because we're a giving church. We give out, we don't just take in, we give out. And uh, you know, uh, we had our Living Well celebration uh, a week before last, uh, or last week, excuse me. And uh, you know, we had 100 people turning into our Bible study. Isn't that amazing? 100 people came. We gave out 103 turkeys to those in walk-ins. And we do all of this. Why do we do Bless a Family? Why do we do these things? Because we want to give back because God has so blessed us. And that's all part of what God wants to do here. As God does a miracle in your life, he expects you in turn to be faithful and to do something to give out to others as well. So here we see that we have a big problem here. Uh, we've got a large hungry crowd. They've been in the middle of the desert all day to hear Jesus teach. And as the day wears on, uh, the, you know, they haven't been fed, they're hungry. Uh, what do we do? Well, you know, uh, the disciples had a solution. Send them away. Where are they going to go? The nearest fast food, Colonel Sanders restaurant, you know, McDonald's. Where were they going to go, you know? They have a problem, you know? There's a big problem here. They need a miracle. They need a miracle. And the first thing that we're going to see here this morning is that... Uh, <laughs> is that uh, we must uh, admit that there are needs that we cannot handle on our own. You have to admit, as well as I do, that there are needs in our lives that we can't handle on our own. And I don't know what you're going through right now, but I know that you, there's our people right here today need a miracle. There's something that you can't do. You, you've tried everything. You cannot do it on your own. And God doesn't want you to. He wants you to turn it over to him, as we're going to see here. They had to admit that they, could, they didn't have an answer. They couldn't do it. And so they had to uh, begin to admit that, God, we can't solve this problem. It's too much for us. It's absolutely too much. Well, you know what? Uh, God does things in our lives uh, for a reason, right? In the book of John, we pick up on this same story. And it says here, as the, as the, this, by the way, this is taught in all four Gospels, this miracle. And so uh, Jesus uh, Lifting up his eyes uh, then and seeing such a large crowd was coming towards him, Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? And he said to test him. He said it to test him, right? For he knew what he was going to do. But Jesus allows needs to come into your lives to test you. That's why they're there, to test your faith, to see what you're going to do about it, to test your faith. And so he tested them. And Philip answered, well, 200 denarii worth of bread would not be enough to, free, to feed these people. And uh, one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, well, Lord, there's a boy here who's got five barley loaves and two fish, <laughs> but what are they among so many? And Jesus said, have the people sit down. And again, the miracle was performed there. But first of all, they had to admit their need. Now, Jesus knew what he was going to do, and he wants you to sometimes admit that you can't solve it. You don't have the answers. You, you don't have the resources. And we, first of all, need to admit there's just problems in our lives that we cannot solve. We cannot solve. Well, you know what? Uh, uh, we have a problem in our lives that we haven't been able to solve. And I have three sons. Um, uh, one's up in Portland. He's an engineer. He's doing well up there. I have another son who lives here, and he's an engineer, and he's doing very well. But we have a middle son that uh, we've had just issues and problems with uh, for years and years and years. And uh, he's been homeless for uh, over seven years of his life. And, uh, but you know what? Uh, we, uh, and through some of your prayers, some of you people prayed. Actually, we haven't seen him in about a year and a half uh, since we've seen him last. Uh, all of a sudden, last week, we get a telephone call. We get a telephone call from another homeless guy in San Miguel, if you know where that is, on 101 down there towards Paso Robles, a little tiny town. And uh, he called us and put Andrew on the phone. And uh, we got a chance to talk to our son. Again, hadn't talked to him in a year and a half, you know. But some of you people prayed specifically for us for this Thanksgiving that we would see a miracle of some sort. And uh, we did. And so we went down there and we saw him and we spent time with him and took him a bunch of supplies. He does have EBT cards, you know, food stamps. 
He is able to do that and so forth. But we gave him a bunch of supplies, spent a lot of time with him, and he was in remarkably good shape, all things considered. We were very, very surprised. And he's not ready to come home yet, but uh, you know we're making progress there. And uh, it was amazing. But you know what he said? He said that along the way, he's been all over the United States. He said along the way, you know who helps me the most out of everywhere I've been are the Christians. He says it's the Christians that reach out and help me along the way. And uh, literally there were some hunters that found him uh, up in a mountain once uh, in very extremely cold weather. He may have died. Uh, But, uh, you know, they helped him, put him on a bus and sent him back home. And, uh, you know, and they were Christians. I mean, isn't that amazing? So we're very thankful that God uh, did, uh, he did a miracle for us this Thanksgiving. And uh, he's in that business of doing miracles. Now, the story's not written yet. Uh, There's still more to it. But I'll tell you, God is working. And we're so grateful and so grateful for all of your prayers as well. Well, these people had to admit they had a need. We had to admit we had a need. We couldn't take care of this kid. We didn't know what else to do. We've done everything possible. And uh, we just have to turn him over to God. And and God is working slowly. But you know, you also need to ask. You need to ask. You know that you're told over 20 times in the Bible to ask. To ask God for things. Over 20 times. Ask and you shall receive. You know, you're told that. If any of you lack wisdom, ask of God. Who gives gives all men uh, to all men liberally. Ask, we're to ask when we, do, when we have a need that we can't uh, fulfill. But you know, that's, uh, that's not our pattern, is it? Our pattern is to fix it ourselves. We're going to fix this thing, you know? We're going to fix it, right? You know, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps and fix it. You know, uh, you don't need it. You can do it. And uh, you know, yeah, sometimes you can fix it. But there's other times there are things in your lives that you cannot fix. There's no way you can fix it. You know, unless God intervenes, it's, it's unfixable. And those are the times that God uses to really stretch our faith and cause us to grow. And that's why he does it. So here they, uh, they pass the buck. It's not our fault, God. We don't know what to do with these people. It's not our problem. We've got 20,000 hungry people here. They've been here all day listening. And uh, what are we supposed to do? Uh, it's not our, not our problem, God. It's not our job. Don't worry, you know. And so they, they throw it back on Jesus, and Jesus throws it back on them and says, hey, you know, what do you think should be done here? Well, you know, they don't know. Well, uh, <laughs> so, uh, uh, so secondly, it says here, secondly, let's look at our second point here, is that we, we need to assess what assets we have to meet our needs. We need to assess what assets we, we have. What did we have? I mean, they had to assess enough assets here. And they said, all we got is these, you know, five loaves and two fishes. That's all we got. Well, uh, you know what? Uh, God can do things that you don't think are possible, and that's exactly what happened here. They forgot the assets they had. They forgot that they had the God right in front of them who could multiply these fish, who could do miracles. They didn't, they didn't think about that. They, they were looking for human solutions. It would take a lot of money, they said, to feed all these people. And the God's trying to, Jesus is trying to get them to say, hey, who am I? <laughs> you know, what can I do? Uh, you've seen me do miracles. Uh, why, why is it that you're not trusting me right now? Why are you trying to figure this out on your own and send them off to McDonald's? Why are you trying to figure this out, God? You know, so uh, anyway, uh, we have to assess uh, what assets we already have uh, to meet our needs. And many times uh, we have to do a realistic analysis of our resources and ask ourselves, God, we don't have it. We, we, we don't have the resources. We cannot take care of this problem. It's beyond us. It's beyond us here. You know what? God always starts with what we have. And, uh, and then he takes what we have, and if we give it over to him, he'll bless it and use it in a way that you never even thought was possible. Sometimes we're not using our resources wisely either, right? And that's when we need to ask God for help and say, God, I've blown it. I didn't use my resources very well. I should have done this. I should have done that. And you don't know how many times we've beat ourselves up over the years because of the way our son turned out. Have you ever done that? You know, we've beat ourselves up. If only we had done this. You know, if we had done that. If we'd done this differently, he wouldn't be this way. You know, we've beat ourselves up as well. But, you know, God had a, God had a different plan. He had a different plan. And I'm so grateful. So, you know, the, so they, they say, well, God, it's humanly impossible. It's financially impossible. It's practically impossible to feed these people. We don't know what else to do. Well, let me ask you a question. Has God ever asked you to do anything impossible? 
Sure he has, right? Has he ever asked you to do something that you believed was just impossible? God, I can't do that. God, I, I, I just, there's no way I can do that, you know. God loves to ask his children to do the impossible. Why? To stretch your faith. God will ask you to do things that are absolutely impossible to stretch your faith. He puts you in situations where you've got nowhere else to turn but to trust God and to uh, allow him to work on your faith. He wants us to see that he can be totally, totally trustworthy uh, during this time. Let me give you an illustration here. A man took his young son to McDonald's. He ordered large fries. As watching his son eat them, he instinctively uh, reached out uh, over and grabbed one of the fries, and his son slapped his hand and said, Dad, you can't have one. Those aren't your fries. And so the, the, the man, the dad, said uh, three thoughts came into his mind when, when that happened. First, he, uh, uh, he realized uh, my child has forgotten that I'm the source of his fries. <laughs> my, that's right. I'm the source of his fries, right? I bought them. And without me, he'd have no fries. <laughs> Secondly, my son has forgotten that I control the fries. I can take them and say, no more fries, or I could go out and buy a truckload of fries if I wanted to because I have the means. And thirdly, he needs to realize that I really don't need his fries. I could buy my own. What I, what I really want is for my son to learn to be unselfish. And isn't that the way, you know, that uh, we look at God sometimes, right? You know, that uh, God, this is mine. And God say, no, it isn't. It's not yours. I gave you this. I gave you all of this. You know, uh, you're to use what I gave you. And uh, you're to be grateful and to be generous. And that word generosity is used over 2,285 times in the Bible. We are called to be generous people with whatever we have. Whatever we have, we're called to be generous here. And why does God want me to be generous? <laughs> you know, because he wants to make you more like him. He wants to make you more like him. Our God is a generous God. Our God is a very generous God here. So we need to assess what assets we have. Uh, the Bible says in Mark uh, uh, 10, 27, what does the Bible say? He says that, uh, I looked at them and said, with man it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible. All things are possible. Our God's a generous God, and he wants us to be generous as well. You know what? We never know when we're going to have another need. Uh, there could be a need tomorrow. You could get a pink slip at work tomorrow. Uh, you could get, uh, uh, you know, a bad grade at school. You could have a relationship issue that develops tomorrow. You could have a financial crisis. Your car could break down. Anything could happen in our lives. We could have a bad prognosis from our doctor. Anything could happen. But God knows the answer before we know the problem. And he's not going to be surprised by it when it happens. But we need to admit that uh, we have a need and we have to look at what we have and we realize that uh, when we don't have enough uh, that God will step in and thirdly we have to acknowledge that God owns it all. God owns it all which means he is capable of meeting any need that you have. The Bible says that God owns the cattle on a thousand hills, right? God, you know, it's no big, God can supply whatever is lacking in your faith. The Bible says ask and you will receive. And we have to realize that, that God uses whatever we give him, even uh, five little loaves and, and two fishes. You know, uh, we call that on, on Thursday nights, we're doing a giveaway after the service on Thursday nights to our Thursday night crowd here. It's called Loaves and Fishes. And uh, you know what? God has just given us the, these resources to do this with, simply, I believe, because we've been generous to use what God has already given us. And as a result, he gives us more. And it's just been a, really just a, uh, there's a whole story behind it, but a blessing of God that we can give away all this stuff on Thursday night. And now, just to get this stuff, okay? So, but, uh, but uh, you know, the, the Thursday night uh, before Thanksgiving, you know, we had 120 in the worship service. We ha have another, you know, with all the wanted kids and helpers, we have another 100 and some people there. And, uh, you know, we, yeah, we, we're able to bless all these people now uh, because uh, we've been generous, and uh, as a result, God is generous to us. So we need to acknowledge that, uh, that God has it all, he owns it all, and as a result of that, it all belongs to him to begin with. 
And that's the beauty of the whole thing. That's the beauty of it all. So, so here you know the rest of the story here. Uh, God, he prays, Jesus prays over it all. He blesses it all. And as a result, of course, there's, there's plenty left uh, for everybody. Uh, you know, you need, as well as I do, to turn everything you have over to God right now. Uh, your life, your assets, anything you have, your health, your jobs, everything needs to be turned over to him. Because God wants you to cheerfully then begin to bless others. There's a bumper sticker that says, God loves a cheerful giver, but he accepts from a grouch. <laughs> That's funny, but it's not true. Because God doesn't want my money if it's giving grudgingly. He doesn't want me to give to others if I'm doing it grudgingly uh, because it represents our hearts, and that's not what God wants. You know that the, uh, the root of the word miserable is the word miser? Did you know that? The root of the word miserable is the word miser. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? Uh, <laughs> that God would do it that way. So, you know what, and when you, most miserable people are those who feel guilty when they're not generous, and then they resent it when they do give. <laughs> those are the miserable people. You know, you notice that there's something we didn't do today in the service, you know. We don't pass the plate. You know, we don't take an offering. You know, it's back there on the tables there, or you can do it online, or you can mail a check to the church. But you know what, we don't, we don't do that to put pressure on people here. Because we want people to give willingly and generously and, and cheerfully. And not because they feel like, oh, here comes that plate. I better, I better throw a buck in there before somebody sees me. You know, they'll, otherwise, they'll think I'm a cheapskate. <laughs> Seriously, I remember my aunt, my mom and my aunt in church. And uh, uh, <laughs> these two, they fought all the time. And my aunt would take her checkbook out when the offering would come. She'd take her checkbook out and she'd hold it up like this and write the check. <laughs> So everybody could see, you know, and my mother would go like this, you know, put that down, all you're doing is giving a lousy 20 bucks, you know, and, and you want everybody to see, you know. You know, we don't, we don't want, we don't want giving like that, folks, we don't want giving like that. You know, we want you to give cheerfully because God has blessed you as a result of that, as a result. So, uh, so fourthly here, uh, we need to... Uh, uh, we need to trust God, we need to trust God that in time, he will bless us accordingly with whatever we entrust to him. We need to trust God that if, in time that he will bless us accordingly with whatever we entrust to him. And uh, that's the beauty of it all here, because God loves a cheerful giver. Notice that what's said in 2 Corinthians here as we look at this passage, 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Uh, verses 6 to 8, it says this. The point is, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves what? A miserable giver. No, God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. You know, so this whole passage, this whole chapter is about how God wants us to be generous, giving people. Uh, that's what Thanksgiving is all about, isn't it? To be thankful for all that God has given us. It's a principle of sowing and reaping here, that God wants us to be like him. God started out by being a giver, right? For God so loved the world that he did what? He gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You see, God gave first. God gave his son to die on a cross for you, to save you, uh, and to, ask, to see that your sins are forgiven so that you could have an eternal relationship with him and a relationship with him right now. God gave first, and he wants us to be give out of the fact that he gave first. He gave to us, and as a result, we always reap back more than what we sow. You know, uh, if I plant a kernel of corn, what do I, do I get one kernel back? No. I get a whole stock full of ears with over a thousand kernels in each one. You know, there's a principle here that as we give and as we're thankful and we're generous people that God gives back. Now, that doesn't mean that if you give a dollar here or you give somebody else a loaf of bread that you're going to get two of them back tomorrow. It doesn't mean that, but over your lifetime, over your lifetime it means 
that as you follow God's principles and you obey him and you tr entrust everything in your life to him, he will bless you in many ways over a lifetime, over a lifetime. Let me give you some, just a few uh, examples. You know, when I first started out as a youth pastor, uh, way back in the dark ages, uh, that, uh, you know, uh, I had an elder who took me aside and he said, Jim, he said, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna give you some advice. He was also a CPA. And he said, uh, there's, there's some things I want you to do. And if you do these things, I promise you, you will be blessing me uh, 30 years after I'm gone, long dead and gone. Uh, you're gonna be singing my praises over the advice I gave you. And he says, Jim, I want you to start out. And he says, I want you to start giving 5% uh, to retirement and 10% to the Lord. And I said, man, I can't do that. I'm a youth pastor. I'm only making a thousand a month. I said, I said, I can't even live on that. And he says, yeah, he says, you don't need to do it all at once, Jim, but start out slowly. Give 1% to retirement, maybe 2% to the Lord, and then increase it as God begins to bless your life. And so I did that, and I followed that as hard as it was. I began to follow that. And God blessed us and continued to bless us because we did that. And uh, because our God is a God who's able to stretch things and make things happen and make miracles happen, our God did that. And as a result, we, uh, we decided after a, a short time there in Reno, uh, I went to the University of Nevada, Reno, where I got my bachelor's degree in business and economics and finance. And uh, uh, you know, we, de we decided, uh, uh, and I also went to seminary after that, but uh, uh, we decided to go to Las Vegas, where Mark is, <laughs> to go to Las Vegas to start a church there. Uh, our association wanted to put a ch start a church there. They didn't have one there. And we decided to go to Las Vegas, and we met with a very small group of people. Uh, we started out with seven. After they met me, we were down to five. But uh, <laughs> we started a church with, with five people, literally. But we didn't have any money. They obviously they couldn't give us, the denomination gave us a, a very, very small amount. And so I had to go to work, you know, and we just prayed, God, you know, th this is in your hands, God. You've called us to do it. We need a miracle. We can't do this. You know, I don't have any money can't do this whole thing, and uh, you know what? Uh, God, through a miraculous set of circumstances, uh, I was able to, to be a waiter in a brand new fancy restaurant on the Las Vegas Strip. It's no longer there, but uh, uh, it had been swallowed up by somebody else. But you know what? God gave us a, and a God gave me an amazing job there, and uh, you know, I, you know, for two years, I made really good money. And as a result, I was able to quit and uh, the, uh, after two years and, and go with the church full time. My wife had also been working at the time. But God continued to bless and bless. And we had all three of our kids were born in Las Vegas. They have that distinction. Where were you born? In Vegas. <laughs> and so, anyway, but, uh, but you know, we bought our first house there. And I got a really good deal on this house. And, uh, and uh, I later was talking to the neighbors and I I said, man, I, this house has been on the market for a while and I got, I got such a good deal, I can't believe it. And they said, well, do you know why you got such a good deal on the house? And I said, no, I said, where are you from? I said, Reno. He said, oh, well, let me tell you the story. So the guy that owned the house uh, that you bought it from, he committed suicide in your, in, your, in your bedroom with a gun. And I'm like, oh, that's before they had disclosure laws in Nevada. And I said, but you know what? I said, God, I'm not superstitious. You know, God, I, I, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna let that rule my life. I don't let that kind of stuff rule because you're bigger than that. You're bigger than all of that. And God continued to bless. The church continued to grow. And as again, we had three kids there, and God did a, a marvelous things. But after seven years, I was the only person on staff there. We had 250, 300 people coming. I was just totally burned out. I just needed a break. And we wanted to move back to California because we had Northern California because we had our three kids and wanted to be around the relatives. And uh, so I started applying for places, and I gave the church plenty of notice, and, uh, but nothing worked out. And so we were literally, literally loading up the U-Haul, getting ready to leave our house in Las Vegas. And I got a call from a church uh, in Concord, California, uh, that wanted to be restarted, and, and another church was, and the association was helping them. And they said, well, you know, we can cover your salary for at least a year, and so you come here and restart that church. It was just, you know, that's how God works. But you know, God gave us a verse before that. There's a verse in Genesis where Abraham left, left, and, he, and what did Abraham do? By faith he went into a what? A land that he knew not. By faith he went to a land that he knew not. Well, that was us, we, we believe that. That God, God just took us and moved us. And through a series of different circumstances, um, God, did a, God did some miracles in our lives. But you know what? Uh, 
That, that, that's not the end of the story either. Uh, God called us to do many different things uh, with our lives, and as a result, he just kept blessing. But did we have hardships? Sure, we had hardships. You know, there, I've, I've, you know I, I quit that job, didn't have a job. Uh, bef the, before I came here, and uh, you know, I've been here since late 98, early 99, before I came here, I'd quit a job. I took an associate job somewhere else, uh, and I only lasted there about seven weeks, and I said, this isn't for me, and I quit. <laughs> I mean, how dumb is that, you know, to get a job for seven weeks, and you quit in the ministry? And so I was out of a job before I came here. And, you know, through a series of circumstances, another pastor recommended that I come here, and I came here on a temporary basis uh, way back in early 99. Been here ever since. <laughs> but, you know, um, you know, God, God blesses, you know. And I retired in 17 and went to Europe for <laughs> year 17. I retired in the year 17. And uh, we went to Europe for about three weeks and saw one of our missionaries there and so forth. And, and uh, he's, he's doing fantastic there. His church there, he has over 1,000 people there, all mostly young people in Budapest, Hungary. And he's one of our supported missionaries. And, uh, you know, I began to think, God, what else do you want me to do? You know, and I'm like, I was like Rocky. Remember the Rocky Balboa movie? Remember his last Rocky movie that he made? Uh, remember uh, Rocky's talking to Polly, and he's going, hey, Polly, Polly, and Polly's going, yeah, what, what, Rocky? And he says, uh, uh, Polly, uh, I, st I still got a fire in the boiler. I still got a fire in the boiler. You know, and, he, and he's a lot older now. And Polly says, oh, forget it, you're crazy. You know, and, and no, no, Polly, I still got a fire in the boiler. And, uh, you know, the rest of the story, Rocky went on to fight at, the, is an old, at an old age and so forth. Well, I kept thinking that, and uh, through a series of circumstances, the church here was going through some issues back in, uh, back in 18, and, uh, you know, the, I decided to come back on to help out as a volunteer. And uh, I didn't want any pay. I just wanted to uh, just help out because God wanted me to do some things here. And uh, now they do give me a small stipend because I sign all the contracts and do a lot of legal work for the church and business work, and I have to be an employee. So I have to be on the payroll at least for a tiny bit, enough to cover, cover my gas. But, you know, God has done amazing things, amazing things. But, you know, over the years, I look back and I say, God, you did things I didn't even think was possible. Uh, we had left uh, Concord, California. We went to Reno and helped uh, start a church up there that uh, was a restarted church that was struggling up there. And uh, there was another pastor up there that was pastoring a little tiny church of 80 people. And I was, uh, I was with this new startup church of 120 people. And uh, just by a series of weird circumstances, the two of us ended up getting together. We didn't know each other from anybody. We got together and uh, uh, was, they were selling their small building because some developer wanted it. And so they had a little bit of money, and uh, we got together, and we decided to, to, to have our offices together. And we put our offices together, and, and I said to Dan, I said, Dan, uh, uh, you know what? Let's do something crazy. Let's start a brand new church here in Reno. And let's, do, let's, just, let's just, you know, try, try it all new. Let's just do something that, that only God can do. And uh, he was up for it. He was a little tired of his, his church. It was going nowhere. It was dead on a doornail. And uh, he said, let's... Uh, Let's do it. And so we put together a brand new church up there in Reno, Nevada. In Nevada and uh, we, he just happened to have somebody in his church who was an administrator at the University of Nevada, Reno. And we were able to rent out a brand new facility there at the university on Virginia Street for our church services. We did massive advertising with some of the money that they had. And uh, God began to grow and bless. And that church today has thousands of people coming to it. And the same pastor is still there, you know. Why did I leave? Well, that's another story. <laughs> but you know what? God, God blessed. God took it and did miracles. You know, because we simply trusted him for something that we couldn't do. We couldn't do that. But God put it all together. Now, has everything been smooth? No, not exactly. There's been plenty of trials along the way, and there will be. But you know what? Over my lifetime, I can see that when you give to God, you give it all to God, all your money, all your possessions, all your kids, your health, your job, you give it all to God and say, God, it's yours, it's not mine to begin. You're the owner, God. You're the guy that bought the French fries, not me. It's all yours, God. You give it all to him, and he in turn will bless accordingly. And now right now, there may be 
in your life a need that you can't solve. There's something you just can't do anything about. There's something you've tried, you, all your assets have run out. You don't know what else to do except trust God. You know, God puts us in those positions for a reason, to test your faith. God says, I'm gonna put you in a situation, I'm gonna give you a need that you cannot solve on your own, and you're gonna to have to rely upon me. And sometimes we, it takes a long time for us to finally submit and to say, okay, God, I'm tired of fighting, I can't do this. God, it's yours, take it. And that's when God begins to work in a marvelous and miracle way. And I don't know what it is that you're going through right now, but I do wanna pray for you right now, that if there's a situation that you're in right now, that uh, you can't solve, you don't have the answers to, you don't have the resources to, uh, what are you gonna do? Well, God's saying, you know what? You gotta trust me with it right now. I want all your finances, I want your kids, I want your families, I want your jobs, I want all your resources, I want your health, I want everything, you give it all to me and trust me for it. And he says, I will do things in your life that you never thought was possible. And that's what God wants to do.